name, uh, and I don't know, maybe some of you write history, but this gentleman was writing history for the pioneer days of Oregon, and in 1905 he wrote this, that he was, a, when he was young in 1870, there were bones of two wrecks seen on the, uh, on the beach. So one of them was the galleon, and one of them is theorized that it would be the, it would be Tallow's Bark also. And here is something else showing that there's different woods made. Now someone did say to me, uh, well, I'll point this out first of all, probably can't read this because it's kind of large here, but small there, I'm sure. But what this really says, this is, these are wood samples that were sent to the University of Washington back in uh, 1970. And there were four samples. There, were, there was one blind sample, which was just a blind sample of teak. And then there was another sample of teak that was from the galleon. And by the way, here at the museum, you have a table, I believe it was a table, that's made from the teak of that ship. Uh, so, uh, which is rather interesting, and that's really where the sample came from. And, uh, and then there were two other samples of wood, and those two other samples of wood were taken, this is not like real scientific, but at least it's samples of wood, were taken from an older lady in Rockaway, but Wayne Jensen supplied the wood from an older lady in, uh, from Rockaway. And those came back, these four samples saying, two of the samples were teak, of course they knew that, and then two of the samples were probably from South America wood. Now, Tello's bark was from South America, and it was built there. So, uh, thinking that these could be samples from Tello's bark because they were showing in 1905 or in 1870, whatever the case may be. And there are plenty of other areas also of comparisons, uh, especially when you read uh, Francis Fletcher's book, uh, and it talks about uh, three quarters of a mile from the Indian sites. Now, he talks about, you can hear the Indians crying three quarters of a mile away from our, from our fort. Well, if you remember the map of, uh, of, uh, of Honduras' map, that's three quarters of a mile from the fort site to the known archeological sites in, in the Halen Bay. Uh, we're talking about the Indians, I already mentioned, going uphill and downhill. Uh, the White Cliffs of Plymouth uh, similarities. Uh, there, uh, Neoconi Mountain, if you're familiar with Neoconi Mountain at all, uh, it's pretty, it's uh, very rugged. They're not just sand dunes like they're all over the place, white sand dunes, but it's a rugged, uh, a cravenous mountain. And that would remind Drake of, uh, of uh, uh, the Do cliffs of Dover uh, being very uh, carvin carnivorous. Uh, that's the, not the right word, I know, but I think you'll understand what I mean. Uh, a lot of ravines in them, too. Uh, they didn't have to be white, okay? Uh, uh, the Indians uh, had a staff of black wood. Fletcher talks about the Indian chief carrying a staff of wood uh, about four and a half to five feet long. Uh, I saw one of those uh, wood staffs, those power sticks, uh, back at the Smithsonian uh, back in July. And it has uh, Indian hair on it and beads or uh, uh, abalone shells. Uh, Clara Pearson, who was an uh, informant uh, in 1932, talked about uh, black staffs uh, of wood also uh, being for the uh, uh, chiefs and the um, shamans. Uh, the Indian houses in dress uh, are all match. Uh, Sermano was talking, he, uh, he landed in California in uh, November, he crashed in November and December. He talks about the Indians being naked down there. Uh, Drake was here in June and July and talks about the Indians still being covered with, with furs, uh, being cold. Uh, so uh, we all understand that, don't we? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, I mean, if, if, uh, if uh, uh, Drake was in California, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the Indian customs, uh, they were giving gifts uh, and they wouldn't accept some gifts uh, that we, and, and this uh, actually talks about a, a potlatch in there. That's really what Fletcher ends up describing in there. Uh, uh, the fishing methods, uh, he said that the Indians uh, would spy fish and uh, sell them miss. Well, the reason why they were miss, wouldn't miss is because they were spearing them. Uh, and they were alongside the, either the, the uh, inside the bay there, which used to have great runs, or up uh, Alder Creek, which was alongside the bay. Well, in California, he was down there, it's all seashore. And you don't, you don't spear fish from the seashore, if anyone knows anything about fishing. Uh, I know, I've tried to fish for the shore, and never got very many. Uh, and uh, there's much, much more, too. And, uh, oh, I'm not supposed to talk about my books. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, what I've had to say about this today. And uh, 
If you want to know any, anything more, I think my website, yeah, my website is on the bottom here. I did have, I do have a few uh, uh, handouts of my slides up here if anyone would like to have copies of those. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. And if you don't, well. <laughs> and that lady over there, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm convinced. I, I, I like the match and everything, but I'm curious why you would do any reference to William Clark's maps when he didn't go south of Cannon Beach, and so <laughs> count that as reliable. Um, his map information would be from, from other seagoing captains, I'm guessing George Vancouver or, or Captain Cook. Um, well, <clears throat> I'm glad you brought up that subject, quite honestly. Um, when, uh, you know who Silas B. Smith was, I'm sure. Uh, Silas B. Smith was the son of Solomon Smith. Uh, Solomon Smith married Celeste. Uh, so Celeste was actually uh, Silas's mother. His mother told him when, when and Silas B. Smith was uh, the person who was out with Heinz, who was the Oregon uh, Historical Society's um, director in 1900 when they went out to find the fort. And with him was also a man called um, uh, uh, Wheeler. I don't remember his na first name off the top of my head, but Wheeler was working for the North Pacific Railroad. And he also had a, a, a photographer with him. And they were actually going through the entire journey also of the, of the Lewis and Clark Trail. And Wheeler wrote a book, and you can just look up the name. Uh, and uh, Silas B. Smith in Wheeler's book says that uh, Silas told him that the whale was in the Halen Bay. There's a bomb for you. Thank you. <laughs> and if you uh, if you look at coups and if you look at um, uh, um, I can't remember the other person who wrote who who, who uh, interpreted the journals, but if you look in their indexes, I think you'll see some reference to the Halen Bay also. I didn't put it in there. Okay. So we have another question. Was that, is that is that a good answer to your question? I don't really know. No, I'm not, I'm not making the whole connection there. But oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you asked me about. Well, and you also said at the beginning that the journals of the Lewis and Clark expedition said something about Halen Bay being 40 miles. South yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 40, yeah. He said the point. It was the Halen Bay was for. Yeah. Where we are now is 40 miles south southeast of, of, of Point Adams. Okay, that's what that's what Clark said, and that's in the Halen Bay. And that's the reason why I gave you the whole story about, about, uh, about uh, uh, Wheeler and Silas B. Smith, because that's what they says in the journal. So you asked me how Clark said that. Clark said that. He did. I, I just he wrote that. Where that in the journal, what, what date that is? Um, uh, January 5th, uh, I believe, ni uh, to 1806. Yeah. yeah. It might be the 6th, but it might be, but it's 5th or 6th. Yeah. So when they're 1806, there, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they have the book here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, if is it okay, Benson? It's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, these are two selected uh, areas. Also, I selected just the survey portion uh, for one book, and I uh, selected just the Indian portion out of another book too, uh, mostly for marketing uh, purposes because it's half the price of the regular book. But if you bought both of the uh, selected writings, you still wouldn't get uh, Costagini survey or all the. Uh, appendixes in the book. So. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Did they ever identify the uh, ballast stones in Wales Cove? Uh, I don't know anything about ballast stones in Wales Cove, quite honestly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I did hear that there was supposed to be some sort of, a, or I have heard that there was supposed to be some sort of a altarpiece uh, in Wales Cove that someone had seen at one time. Uh, uh, theoretically, the story goes something like uh, it was an altarpiece that Drake may have taken, uh, but I, that's, that's all I know about it, quite honestly. Yeah. But keep in mind, Wales Cove doesn't have any islands off of it, uh, nor do they have uh, Indian archaeological sites that are three quarters of a mile away, other than up behind them, which you wouldn't have heard it because they're down on the beach and you would never hear something three quarters of a mile away up, up above you. And that's the same, same uh, uh, thing for the California people, too. So. Yes, sir. The, the uh, California contingent, do they have books? Oh, yes, books? they printed lots of them. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's all sort of things like I showed there, quite honestly, too. Um, 
yeah, if you just look up Drake Navigators Guild, you'll find lots of their information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, when I spoke at OMSI, uh, 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 I had invited uh, their president, uh, Ed Von der Parten, uh, and uh, Ed came to the talk, and he sat right there, wrote a lot of notes, and I said, well, I'd like to introduce uh, Ed Von der Parten, and, you know, and uh, he, he stood up and wanted to start debating the whole thing, and started, Instead of asking me a question, he wanted to address the audience. <laughs> I said, no, Ed, we're not going to do that. We'll do that some other time. But he's a really smart man. He's a nice man, too. And he's been doing it 60 years, too. So, Yes? What do you feel would be the uh, definitive find that would lay this uh, Bill McCoy thing to rest? <laughs> um, in my mind, it's already been done, quite honestly. Uh, we have a 16th century survey. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the survey markers, uh, have, uh, most of them are, or half of them are in the Tillamook County uh, Pioneer Museum, uh, and the other half are in the Wayne Jensen's private collection, which I have control of, which, you know, whatever happens to that one eventually, you know, in his library, I don't know. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, someone's going to have to go out there and start digging around the fort. However, it's very, very difficult uh, where it is because there's been so much driftwood that's been built in, and even talks about this in Fletcher's book, uh, the Indians throwing themselves down on this, on, this, on this driftwood. That's really what he talks about. He doesn't say driftwood, but uh, well, all this driftwood has been on, on top, on top, on top, and then it's grown on top of that. So when you're walking out there, you could actually just walk right through it and walk through into water. And it's very difficult, so you couldn't use ground penetrating radar. and. Uh, or you could, uh, in fact, they've done a very preliminary thing with a uh, uh, magnetometer out there, but because they've done a lot of hunting out there, uh, duck hunting, there's lots of uh, empty uh, shotgun shells out there, and you know, you just keep on getting dings, and you know, and that's what it picks up. So uh, it'll be a real project. Uh, but the, but the county, uh, is part of it's on the county property, the county is all for it. They have said, you know, go for it, just write us out something when you're gonna do it, you know, so and it's not that they're against it, they're for it. So. Other than that, hopefully that uh, Scott Williams and his, his men find something that uh, says, you know, yeah, out in the water, yeah, yeah, so. There was a question, yes, sir. I'm sorry? Oh, gee, you know, that's one of the 18 that I mentioned, and I'm really not familiar with that one, but I know about, it was the Goleta, I've been to Goleta, you know, uh, and Goleta, if I remember right, is just a beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the Indians probably don't match up at all, I would say. Oh, yeah. I heard about those cannons at one time, and then uh, I read something about it, but I don't remember exactly what it was. I don't think, I, don't, I really don't, don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that could be uh, Cavendish had lost a ship, you know, because Cavendish split, he had two ships by the time he got on this side of the, the horn and they split up and one of them sort of they thought maybe went north and they found things at Catalina and you know, so we really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Cannon does not create, create anything. All right, well, Gary, thank you very well, much. Well good, thank you all, appreciate coming too. Thanks.